Okay, so let's begin. Lunch with Lambda. Um, first things first, I'm going to talk very slowly just to check that um, somebody can give me some feedback in the chat, perhaps, that you can hear me and that that's all good. Um, I don't want to continue in silence. Uh, silence of the Lambdas is not quite where we're going with this. Um, so what we're going to talk about is Lambdas, because Lambdas are these things that people um, go on and on about. Uh, every language must have them. Every language now seems to have them. I mean, I'm sure that even out there, COBOL programmers are now being subjected to um, uh, being subjected to lambdas. Uh, whether they use them or not is a completely different question. Um, C plus plus acquired its lambdas in um, 2011. Um, Java acquired its lambdas uh, in 2014. So um, you know, there's an interesting time sequencing there. Um, meanwhile, JavaScript is sitting there in the background, going like, "Come on, 1995." Um, but I want to look much more at the history of this. I also want to disabuse people of the idea that if you're using lambdas, you must be doing functional programming. Um, lambdas are a deeper, more fundamental idea, um, both in procedural programming uh, and object-oriented programming. In fact, computation. Um, they happen; to, they do have an intimate relationship with functional programming, but you'll actually see that they are far more universal. Um, so simply adding lambdas to a language does not make it functional. That, that's a function of other aspects. But I want to get inside. What do we actually mean by this thing? People think they know because normally because of the language they're working in. Um, so I want to go back in time. Uh, and explore uh, some of these uh, some of these thoughts. So uh, here is that letter, and I got to say, I mean, if you have to have a favorite Greek letter, uh, this is this is kind of um, this is a this is a good one, really. And it gets used and recycled, and it it gets abused. Um, you know, uh, Amazon have a thing called Lambda, which is nothing to do with lambdas. Um, a lot of people associated with Half Life, uh, from which they get there's the decay constant. Um, but physicists like to overload things. That's also the wavelength. And then there's calculus. That's the one we want. Now, where did this stuff originate? So everybody else is going around like, ooh, we've got lambdas in our language. And uh, that's very 21st century. Um, 1932, if you're looking, um, uh, the first paper in which uh, Alonzo Church, the creator of lambdas, um, uh, actually introduced this stuff. I've seen people cite this as 1940s. This is actually the earliest paper. I struggled to get my hands on it, actually. Um, uh, there's a 1936 paper I'm going to refer to in a moment. Uh, uh, but uh, watching one of my, uh, a different version of this talk, uh, Eduardo Simões um, uh, managed to dig this one up and uh, sent it to me. And we've got to understand what's going on in the 1930s. I mean, there's a lot of really crappy stuff going on in the 1930s, um, uh, which we appear to be repeating at the moment. Um, uh, but there was also a greater challenge, um, the challenge of... Uh, logic and maths uh, and science, um, there had been this such great confidence at the end of the 19th century that we will be able to know everything and formulate everything, and everything is describable in a consistent and complete system. Um, and, Alonso, uh, and, and that dream started shattering. So uh, using this formalism, uh, Alonzo Church created this, and he was looking at logic in this particular one. It turned out there was actually a flaw in the paper revealed in 1935, um, and uh, we'll get to 1936 in a moment. So I'm not really going to refer to this. Um, I am not a mathematician by training, so whenever I look at this stuff, I'm kind of sitting at it, looking at it through a lens of minor incomprehensibility. Um, but I did notice that there's some really interesting observations. Um, Church makes a very clear claim, it's, um, just a very philosophical one. It's kind of interesting that this is a, a quite a, a deep paper um, on other aspects of logic. But right near the beginning, we do not attach any character of uniqueness or absolute truth to any particular system of logic. The entities of formal logic are abstractions invented because of their use in describing and systematizing facts of experience or observation. And their properties, determined in rough outline by this intended use, depend for their exact character on the arbitrary choice of the invention. Basically, what he's saying there is, I'm not a Platonist. There are all these different theories. Does mathematics, uh, is it uh, mathematical truths, truths of the universe, or are they constructed? So he's definitely uh, maths as an invention. Um, 
However, we, we hit a number of knowability issues, and here is the paper in 1936, which is far more easily obtainable, an unsolvable problem of elementary number theory. He took the Lambda idea much, much further. And this was a period when people were exploring, and, you know, uh, exploring this kind of like totality, the idea of everything being knowable, and that dream was falling apart. It was falling apart in, in physics as well. Uh, general relativity gave us the black hole. Um, quantum mechanics gave us uncertainty. So really, we really weren't sure and we had boundaries on our knowledge. Surely this couldn't be the case with maths. So 1911, Russell and Whitehead, um, uh, so Bertram Russell and Alfred North Whitehead published Principia Mathematica, um, and everything's proven, and it's great, and they introduced type systems. However, 1931, so that sets the context for Church's first paper. Um, Gödel came up with his incompleteness theorems, his two theorems, um, which basically blew apart the whole thing the idea of absolute knowability. And we keep finding these boundaries of knowability popping up. And I plan to do at some point another talk uh, referring to examples of where um, Gödel's incompleteness uh, uh, stuff actually plays into the life of a regular C++ programmer. Um, so there are things that cannot be proven within the system. And I also noticed that Adrian Collier in his observation on this makes a very good point about um, this idea uh, if you happen to be working in machine learning, please don't fall for the fantasy that you're doing something that your data somehow describes um, the real world and is therefore self-consistent and fair and provable. It's not. You need to step outside that system in order to determine its fairness. This is actually a deeper truth. Um, how do I test a system? How do I understand its correctness? You can only understand it by putting it in a broader context. That is effectively uh, one of the outcomes. Um, so this is all good stuff. Um, this is great. So what we've ended up with is something that decades later, Douglas Adams observed in Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. We demand rigidly defined areas of doubt and uncertainty. And that is what we have um, in maths, in physics, um, and in computing. Um, but that's not really why we want to explore lambdas. That may be why they were introduced and why they were um, uh, actually explored as an idea. They were not actually for people to put in their programming languages, there was no concept of programming languages. But the first programming language to do anything with this was Lisp. Now, Lisp was designed in the late 50s. I, I, strictly speaking, it's not a language of the late 50s because it was only designed. And I think we should, I think we are all mature enough to know that a paper-based design is not the real thing. Um, the first implementation was 1960s. So we're going to call it a child of the 60s. So we're basically talking about, it's, it's been 28 years since the Lambda was invented. Um, and how do we characterize it? Um, so uh, digging around online, I found this, uh, a few things. I wanted to see what other people say about Lambdas. And um, so there's some kind of interesting things. Despite the fancy name, a Lambda is just a function, peculiarly without a name. That's kind of interesting. Um, although some people will quibble. They will actually say that this is a different concept, that anonymous functions are different. We'll get perhaps mention that a little later. Um, however, I've got some good news for you. Um, this is the classic quote. There are only two hard things in computer science, cache and validation and naming things. Um, we've just solved that. If, if, we have, if we have nameless functional entities, that solves the problem. Um, and cache and validation is only of interest to us in a stateful system. Given that mathematics is not a stateful system, um, then this is no longer a problem. And we have solved computer science, and it's not even lunchtime. Uh, so let's go back. Let's go back to um, this paper. What does he do? What's he, what's he introducing? Um, we select a particular list of symbols consisting of the symbols open, close, curly, open, close parens, lambda, and open, close square brackets. Um, so except for lambda, this is great. These are all remarkably familiar. And an innumerably infinite set of symbols. Hmm, interesting. That basically means he opened the way for emoji. Um, to be called variables. And we define the word formula to mean any finite sequence of symbols out of this list. Um, and uh, Phil has just observed there are only two remaining problems off by one errors. Um, yes, we're going to get to counting in a bit. Um, uh, it, that's quite interesting. Um, so uh, a formula. So here's your conventional way of thinking about a formula. This is the way that many of us are taught in, uh, in maths and um, other numerous subjects. What we're saying with lambdas is um, that we've got this. In fact, importantly, that f, I'll come to that f, that's not that is not a, a, an equation in that sense. It is not an equivalence. It is an abbreviation. And that has some important uh, consequences, which I won't be able to explore in the scope of this talk. 
But if we look at um, simple lambda expression, um, lambda of x, um, and the formula is y of x, then there are what are sometimes referred to as the three laws of lambdas or the three, uh, three things that make a lambda. You've got variables. Okay, and that's an introduced variable. You've got an abstraction. This is a functional abstraction. Um, and you've got the ability to apply a lambda. In lambda calculus, I'm just going to make a simple observation. In lambda calculus, there are only lambdas. Um, and so therefore, everything is a higher order function. Um, there are no other kinds of things. So hence why sometimes people talk about the untyped lambda calculus. Um, so you can have variables, you can abstract, and you can apply. The other things that we may also be of, inter uh, of interest here is that F is an abbreviation. F is not an equivalence. In other words, um, this stands for the thing on the right. I cannot use F on the right-hand side. This basically means that there is no such thing as recursion in lambda calculus, which is immediately going to make a few people go, well, wait a minute, hang on. If this is all functional stuff, and I told you it isn't, if this is all functional stuff, where do I get my recursion from? Well, that's a construct. Uh, recursion is a higher order construct, um, comes out of things like combinators, the Y combinator and the Z combinator, again, beyond the scope of this talk. But it is an abbreviation. It is a substitution. Wherever I see an F, I should be able to simply replace the text um, of the abbreviation with the text on the right-hand side. It's a simple substitution. Uh, these are bound variables. Um, parameters, if you like. And then we have free variables. In other words, to be precise, it is, it, it's not free as a bird, it's free because it exists in some outside context. The concept of scope, if you like. Um, but scope is not a thing we really have to worry about normally in maths. And it turns out to be a more, uh, it's a thing we genuinely have to worry about um, in uh, programming. And it's we will come to that in a moment. So historically, you might have written, let's just say we have a function called square. And we're going to, um, we are going to uh, uh, define it um, classically. Um, square of x is uh, equal to x times x. If we do this lambda wise, then um, uh, square is a an abbreviation of lambda x um, with respect to x times x. So that's that's great. Um, the symbol that you choose for a bound variable is not important. Um, and Church said innumerably infinite. So I said emojis. Um, so. Um, uh, here we go. Um, this is what is actually, just as a minor point, this is called an alpha. This, these are alpha equivalent. In other words, it basically means it doesn't matter what letter you choose. Um, and I've chosen the emoji of a frowning face, which means that this is indeed a cross product. Um, and we can, and I don't apologize for that. Um, we can further abbreviate this to actually be a square. And then the, we can apply it. The square of seven is equivalent to this, is equivalent to this. I've just gone and used a number. I've just thrown a number in there, seven. Okay, I've just used an integer. I made a throwaway remark that there's no numbers. There's no numbers. Um, an unsolvable problem in elementary number theory, uh, numbers are too complicated. Alonzo Church basically, he basically said, you know, numbers are too tricky. Tell you what, we're going to get rid of them. We're going to have no numbers. We're going to build our own numbers. If you want the software craft movement, this is the ultimate artisan integers. I am going to create my own integers. None of that nonsense that you get with language. Oh, no. Which is, by the way, this is uh, this is a rather important point. I do want to make this because some you get two kinds of programmers. Programmers who kind of go with the humor, uh, uh, the humor and the intellectual insight that this offers them. And then other programmers go, well, how can I use this at work? Because this isn't as efficient as an int uh, that is 32 bits wide. What I'm going to show you in the rest of this talk is not for the consumption of your um, main product uh, at work. It is for the consumption of your brain. So what we're going to do is we're going to invent our own numbers and we're going to start from zero. Interestingly, um, Church in his 1936 paper, this is where he did all of this, did not start from zero, um, but we, we can start from zero. That's perfectly applicable. So what is zero going to be? Well, what we've got is we've got a lambda of f over a lambda of x that is going to yield a, a value of x. Um, that's not immediately what I'm doing here. I've got nested lambdas. Strictly speaking, lambdas only take one parameter. Um, so the way you get multi-parameters is by having a lambda with a lambda, okay? So uh, syntactically, we'll get to that in a moment. This is not very exciting. Let's kind of have a look at one. Ah, okay. So now we're actually using f. So lambda of f, respect to lambda of x, f of x. Again, it's not immediately obvious what's going on here. Now it starts getting more interesting. Two 
is f of f of x. 3 is f of f of x. In other words, what we are doing is we are defining numbers by their application. We are not defining them as platonic objects out there in the universe. We're not using the Pino set-based approach. We are doing, we are basically defining what zeroness is. So threeness is, um, as it were, the threeness of F. It is F on F on F. It is doing something three times. It's three applications. That is threeness. So what we are doing is describing what we mean by threeness, rather than there being a unique object, um, a unique object uh, out there that is three. So it is a, it's more an action in this case. Now, it turns out that there is a shorthand. But this is so common that we are going to go lambda f dot lambda x. Yeah, right. OK, this is a shorthand. But just so that you know, originally, this the idea is that a lambda takes one thing, returns one thing. That's it. There's no zero arg. There's no n args. That's the original idea. But this is a tolerable um, uh, and reasonable variation. So we can say anything that still does this, and so therefore uh, any any programming language is going to struggle with, uh, well, possible exception of Haskell and languages of that nature. Most programming languages are going to struggle with the idea of just having single uh, parameters, um, certainly based on their syntax. So we've got this very very simple idea of the uh, endness or the somethingness. Um, and we could actually, there are other abbreviated forms. Um, so we can say that f on f of x is um, f2, f3, and so on. Um, so we've got you know a regular way of describing this. So let's let's look at seven. And I'm gonna what I'm gonna do is I want to say you, you might be going well. This is all very abstract and it's not very real, Kevin. You know, uh, you know when I think about it from my maybe my C and C plus plus universe. Um, in fact, a lot of the time, unless I'm specifically making a point about lambdas uh, or C++ code, when I use C, I am referring generally to that whole family, um, including BCPL and things like that. The idea of a bitwise representation, that numbers are expressed in this way. And you might say, well, this doesn't have any real impact on modern programming languages. And in that, you might be slightly wrong. So here's seven. Now, what flavor seven is this? This happens to be a seven from Ruby. And Ruby takes a lot of its inspiration um, from Smalltalk, which I will also um, have the chance to refer to later in the talk. So it takes its inspiration from Smalltalk. And it turns out the numbers really do actually do things. They're not just sitting there passively, only supporting arithmetic. The somethingness, the endness, the sevenness of seven can be applied. You want to you want to you want a loop where you just repeat something a number of times. I'm sure you've written this a thousand times. Well, possibly more. Um, the idea of four loops is rather cute and antiquated and very procedural. No, we should get number seven to do the work for us, or get n, whatever n is. Let's get it to do the work. Here's a block of code, or funnily enough, this is actually I'm passing it a lambda effectively. Um, here's a block of code. Please um, apply this um, n times, whatever you are. If you are threeness, then it should be the threeness of uh, I put S I, and this will quite happily print out on screen. Uh, this. Now, there's something else that I want to uh, focus on uh, because we're going to need a little bit later in the talk to actually turn this stuff into C plus plus, and um, it turns out that C plus plus does not have a short form lambda. Its lambda is quite wordy um, because. Um, C++ is not a functional language, and it's actually not, strictly speaking, one of the best procedural languages in this sense. Uh, it missed a couple of tricks. So I'll make a couple of observations about that. But unfortunately, it does get a little bit wordy when you start using um, lambdas. Of course, it is more abbreviated than having to factor out a separate function, um, a separate name function. And of course, it is a shorter form than it might otherwise have been. But nonetheless, it is not as brief as the stuff we've shown on screen already. So we're going to need a simpler way of dealing with numbers. Um, so. Um, suck zero. Well, there's an instruction. Um, ah, right. Okay. I see what I'm doing here. What I'm doing here is I'm basically saying one is the successor of zero. That's another way of defining. Instead of actually going for the fness, um, the, uh, uh, the, the, let us go for the successor of zero and two, therefore, is the successor of the successor of zero and so on and so on. So we're going to need to define, um, uh, uh we're going to need to have a function suck. We can, we can do this. Um, that's another way of doing it. Or we can just yeah, learn to count properly. Um, one is the successor of zero, two is the successor of one, and so on. And so this all kind of looks reasonably familiar. The successor function looks a little bit like this. Um, you don't have to hold that in your buffer. We'll revisit it a bit later. But that's a very simple idea. Notice what we're just doing here. We are basically creating maths 
uh, a, a numeric system, uh, an integer system from the ground up. And that's what Church was doing. Uh, he didn't do it just to play around with talks and to add features to programming languages. He was after something a little bit deeper. Um, we're not after that depth. Um, we know that um, there are certain things that are unprovable uh, and all the rest of it. We're after what good is it for us? What good is it for us in our code? So you may have heard of lambdas before. Perhaps you've used them in other languages. I, I quite like this little introduction in uh, in Ruby. It's just like, yeah, get, you get used to it. Okay, well, let's let's deal with uh, another language. I've just shown you a couple of things in pure lambda calculus. I've shown you something um, in uh, Ruby. Um, and uh, let's do square in uh, C++, which now, thanks to um, uh, auto everywhere philosophy, uh, I can now write very simply. And I think I first saw this syntax in 2003, maybe 2004, Greg Colvin did a talk at the ACCU conference um, in Oxford, and he kind of, you know, blue sky, you know, maybe the future of C++ is we won't have to put too many types everywhere and all this template noise. So here we are. Um, so that is a regular function definition. How am I going to get the equivalent out of a lambda? Well, just a little bit of rearrangement, and we're all good. And if I take if I take the square of seven, I get the right result. I can do a substitution. And this is what I mean. C++ is not given to brevity in this. Um, I can put it all on one line and make it less readable. But because of the fact it's statement oriented rather than expression oriented, I get a whole load of extra noise, which is mildly frustrating. Now, there's this other observation. Um, which I thought, they're anonymous little functional spies sneaking into the rest of your code. Really? Given the amount of uh, concerns we have over um, uh, over security these days, I'm not entirely sure that's the best way to frame it. That makes me feel uncomfortable. But it is an observation. Um, people do mentally associate lambdas with functional programming, and I want to get that out of your head. It's just, it's just, you know, you, do, you add lambdas to something that doesn't make it functional. Um, there's, you know, there's perfectly acceptable functional systems that don't have lambdas. Um, Simon Peyton Jones, kind of Mr. Haskell, observed Excel is the world's most popular functional language. Um, it also is a it's a good way to bring functional programmers down a peg. It's most languages are uh, uh, most languages uh, almost paradigms have a very broad range of expression. There is normally a very pure example that we hold up and we say that is lovely and wonderful and true. And then there's the bit that everybody uses. And the bit that people don't want to admit is the fact that the people in the accounts department of their companies have been doing functional programming for decades longer than they have. Mm -hmm. um, but it also tells you that there are questions of execution. The type system and so on and the defaults in Excel are a nightmare. It is a wretched tool like every other spreadsheet I've ever encountered. I think spreadsheets are a great idea. I just wish somebody would implement them properly. Um, so that's kind of just a recalibration. Let's have a look at Lisp, the the grand uh, uh, the grandparent of all of these. So how do I introduce Lambda there? I, I basically say, hey, look, here is my abstraction. It's a Lambda with respect to X, and I use um, uh, Cambridge Polish notation times X, X, to get my multiplication. It is a true lambda. I can apply it very, very easily. And that works out really nicely. Um, you know, and I do kind of recommend that people have a, a kind of a, it, it's worth looking at Lisp. There's a certain simplicity um, uh, that kind of frees your brain. Um, but you do start getting the idea that maybe we should have Lisp everywhere and, and so on. And there's this lovely XKCD cartoon. Um, last night I drifted off while reading a Lisp book. Suddenly I was bathed in a suffusion of blue. At once, just like they said, I felt great enlightenment. I saw the naked structure of Lisp code unfold before me. The patterns and meta-patterns starts. And there's a there's a there's a nice nice joke there. My God, it's full of cars. Um, so to need to get that joke, you need to know a bit about Lisp, and you need to watch 2001: a Space Odyssey. So that's your homework if you haven't already done it. Truly, this was the language from which the gods wrought the universe. Mm, no, it's not. I mean, ostensibly, yes. Honestly, we hacked most of it together with Perl. And we lost the documentation on quantum mechanics. Uh, you'll have to decode the regexes yourself. Um, and there is a point here. You can actually do all of this lambda -y type of stuff in most scripting languages. But I'm going to take a different path here. I'm going to look at a language which is one of the um, which is one of the kind of the granddaddies, one of the influences. Biana um, explicitly states this is an influence on C++. Um, Algol 68. Um, so just to let you know, these pictures of old programming language books and stuff. They're mine. I quite like programming history, and occasionally I will go out and buy a book that is uh, archaic in that sense. Um, Alpha 68 is 
probably one of the most influential languages you've never heard of or never used. Um, uh, I've had the opportunity to mess about with it because, you know, thanks to uh, the internet, you can normally find a free compiler. Some, but some dedicated soul will have done something. Um, and so I've messed about with it a little bit because it's a fascinating language, highly influential um, and yet largely forgotten. And it was it made no pretense to be functional. It made no pretense to be object oriented. It was a procedural language. That's what it did. And we find that in this very procedural language, there were lambdas. There were procedures, anonymous procedures, but they were lambdas because it's the most procedural idea. If the fundamental idea of the procedural language is the procedure, then I should be able to pass procedures around. It is a fundamental first-class citizen of language. Procedures don't need names any more than integers need names. I should be able to pass them around freestanding as values. Um, minor points about Algol 68, I said it's influential. If you've ever wondered where the struct keyword, the union keyword, int, bool, short, long, void, etc. All of these came from Algol. If you are a bash programmer, you've ever wondered about if and fee, that's from Algol as well. There's a whole load of stuff in there. There's a whole load of other stuff, uh, some of it experimental and a bit wild, but honestly, for the late 60s, there's some ingenious stuff and many languages are still trying to catch up with some of the invention of the language. Um, so this is a this is the ultimate realization. This is indeed a value. I can pass it around. I can use it in basis of assignment. Um, I can declare the variable. Um, that's what it looks like. Um, and then I can go ahead and I can apply it. And it is a true lambda because I can apply it freestanding. So it's procedural. And I've just also showed you Lisp, which is kind of like you know, grandparent of uh, the functional languages. And then there's this observation. Lambdas in Ruby are also objects, just like everything else. Whoa, hang on. Which one are these? And this is the problem when people try to tie features down to a, uh, to, to a paradigm and say this language feature is exclusive to this paradigm. They normally find a paradox in their own thinking. Um, I tend to think of paradigms and language features as being a lot more like a mixing board. Um, um, in other words, you know, I can have lambdas, you know, I can, I can have lambdas in, in most paradigms ha can be re expressed or have a concept that is um, equivalent, cognate with uh, uh, lambdas. Um, but I can turn that up and down. OK. Um, and different languages express that differently. Procedural should have it, but many procedural languages turn it down. It is more fundamental to functional. So that has it fairly high. A little bit like things like immutability. Um, when I think about functional programming, then immutability, that that fader is all the way up. Um, in other languages, um, immutability is still often a good practice, and we'll actually find these practices um, about you know, very simple things about like not reassigning and recycling variables date back to the 70s, and they, they have broader applicability. So there's the, think of it in terms of a mix of um, uh, uh, the overall sound balance on a desk. So back in the 70s, um, there was this whole series of papers, Lambda the Ultimate, um, from Guy Steele and others, and somebody parodied one of the observations uh, or, or one of the, the, the tales and characters in uh, some of Guy Steele's work in a, a rather nice way. Um, the venerable Master, uh, master Kwok Na was walking with his student, Anton, hoping to prompt the master into a discussion. Anton said, Master, I have heard that objects are a very good thing. Is this true? Kwok Na looked pityingly at his student and replied, oh, foolish pupil, objects are merely a poor man's closures. Let's talk about closures. So this is a term that gets thrown around, um, uh, sometimes not with as much clarity as we would like, um, sometimes with lots of clarity. Um, so uh, referring to the sink of all human knowledge, Wikipedia, the, um, it actually has quite a, one of the best, better histories summarised. Concept of closures was developed in the 1960s for the mechanical evaluation of expressions in the lambda calculus. This is the bit where the rubber hits the road and the code hits the processor. In other words, in maths, you never have to worry about crazy things like side effects, you know, pure function. There is no such thing as a pure functional programming language. Um, you can demonstrate that very easily. Next time somebody gives you a demo um, of a, Hask a piece of Haskell code, um, just um, pull the, uh, uh, the battery pack or the... Um, uh, the uh, plug out of the socket, and you will suddenly discover that when the program uses zero energy, it doesn't actually run. Um, this is an important observation. Maths doesn't really care about this stuff. The minute you actually have to compute stuff, you've got to make some decisions. And it turns out things like scope matter. And there were a lot of issues in the early days. 
Um, Phil carefully observes that it becomes non-functional in that case. Very accurate observation. Um, and uh, the pun award for the talk goes to Phil so far, based on what I've seen. Uh, so uh, Peter Landon defined the term closure in 64 as having an environment part and a control part. Uh, for those of you with long memories and uh, experience of Delphi, there is a concept in Delphi that is basically a bound member function pointer. Um, you know, in other words, take bind, take a pointer to an object and uh, and bind it to a member function. Um, hence why we might call it a bound pointer. Uh, they call them closures. That always confused me um, because it seemed a misinterpretation of the the, uh, the term. But I now, if I look at this, I can understand why the folks at Borland made this oversimplification um, and, and called them uh, closures. But they are genuinely not really closures. So Joe's, uh, Joel Moses uh, credits Lander with introducing the term closure to refer to a Lander expression whose open bindings, those free variables, have been closed or bound in the lexical environment, the surrounding scope, resulting in a closed expression or closure. Now, I mentioned um, Guy Steele before, uh, Gerald Sussman. Uh, this usage was subsequently adopted by Sussman and Steele when they defined a scheme. So in the mid-70s, um, they created that this is how you solved problems. Um, in, in the 70s in the AI community. When you had a problem, you created a new language based on Lisp, and Scheme was one such creature. Um, Scheme was created, uh, its original name was Schema, because that fitted in with the other languages people created, Mapper, Planner, you get the kind of gist, Schema. The only problem is that um, Schema um, requires seven letters, and the OS they were using only allowed you six letters, hence the name Scheme. Um, so, back to Anton and his misadventures with Master Cognard. Chastised, Anton took his leave from his master and returned to his cell, intent on studying closures. He carefully read the entire Lambda of the Ultimate series of papers and its cousins and implemented a small scheme interpreter with a closure-based object system. This is kind of the basis um, of uh, this. We can even see a Lambda um, lurking there on the front, uh, structural interpretation of computer programs. Um, so... Abelson, Sussman and Sussman. This came out of the work of Sussman and Guy Steele. But one of the most interesting thing um, was this um, evaluator. Um, uh, so uh, let me just pause for a moment. Um, Patrick, uh, Patrick Quist, um, uh, wondering what this actually is. I know Delphi pretty well, but this doesn't ring a bell. Um, Object.method, I can pass that one round. And I think there was also a workaround for Ball and C++ and they had it as double underscore closure. Um, if that makes any sense, a quick Google might get you the, the right thing. I'm not going to do a quick Google now, um, but um, that I am working from memory here. So forgive me if I have got that one wrong, but that, that that's what rings a bell in my head. Um, a point of function, a bound point of function. So basically if I took a an object just using stood bind, if I use stood bind, the member function pointer, and um, the uh, uh, reference or pointer to the object itself uh, as the next one, that would be how we would write that in C++. In other words, it would be by library rather than by language, but um, that is um, that was a feature of the language um, in, uh, in Delphi. It also inspired... Um, Microsoft to abuse the language and not misuse the term closure. They decided to create the term delegate to mean something other than what delegation actually means, but they that's where that came from. It was inspired by Delphi. Uh, so let's have a let's have a quick look here. Oh, by the way, yeah, thing I haven't mentioned. I'm there's a there's a flow to this talk, and I'm quite happy um, to uh, just look at uh, questions. Uh, as they pop up either in the chat window or the Q&A window. So, you know, uh, please do that. I'm, there is a point where I will take questions explicitly, but there's a whole load of stuff to get through. So as things come up, please, if they uh, don't, don't, don't save them. Um, uh, uh, let it all, let it go. You know, um, I believe there's a song about that. Um, so what's this? This is something that was actually in the original list book, but this has now been translated to scheme. It was one of the most profound ideas. Alan Kay of small talk, had this um, notion. He said, these are Maxwell's equations for, um, these are Maxwell's equations for uh, uh, computer science, for programming languages. Uh, a very profound idea. In other words, uh, homo iconicity, the ability to represent a program within itself, which is kind of one of those mind-blowing things. It's like when you first, um, when you first 
uh, discover, you know, I remember first discovering, wait a minute, what's, what's C written in? C, oh, the C compiler is written in C. What, how does that even work? Uh, yeah. What you have to do is you need a little bit of bootstrapping. So there is this idea of a language, um, uh, uh, there is a language, lang define the language in itself. And then there's a little bit you have to translate to get the whole thing going. Or you do a clever little bit of cross compilation, change the back end, whatever. The idea here is that this is the definition of scheme in scheme. And what is, it's a very elegant, very simple definition. Um, you know, very, very simple. You know, what am I looking at here? So we're going to evaluate, we're going to evaluate, so eval function, an expression with respect to an environment. We've got all the ingredients there. Um, here is a conditional. Um, in other words, this is an if, else, if, else, if. Um, is the expression self-evaluating? Is it an expression? Is it quoted? Is it an assignment? Is it definition? Is it an if? Is it a lambda? Is it a block? And so on and so on. And then we will evaluate it appropriately. If it's self-evaluating, is expression self-evaluating? If so, just yield the expression. Um, is expression a variable? Well, look up the variable. It, kind of meaningful variable names. This is nice. Um, lambda. Ah, okay. It's a lambda. Okay. Make a procedure. Make a closure. Capture the scope, lambda parameters, lambda body, and now evaluate it. So this is kind of kind of neat. So this is it's this bit that was really interesting, and this is also, by the way, a uh, a focus of why we want our code to be kind of like compact and expressive. Um, why was Scheme developed? Um, it was it was developed uh, out of an initial attempt to understand the actorness of actors. Um, 1972, 73, um, Carl Hewitt uh, came up with what the actor theory, uh, the actor model. I, I studied the actor model, did my kind of master's thesis on uh, on it uh, a number of years ago. And the Carl Hewitt stuff is like kind of crazy. Um, these days, actor, the actor model of computation has come back into fashion. Um, I remember being slightly dismayed coming out into industry, discovering that nobody had heard of it. And that my master's degree, as anybody who's ever done a, any kind of further degree, is on a real you know, I, I express deep, deep, deep sympathy for anybody who's got a PhD. You come back in the industry and people really haven't heard of what you're doing. Um, so actors, really interesting idea. Uh, we often associate them with functional programming, but they're also an object model. Um, there's a lot of stuff going on. And the way Carl Hewitt expressed it, uh, was not, it was not immediately obvious what he was doing. So let's solve the problem. Let's, let's create a language where we can explore this. Um, so this interpreter attempted to intermix the use of actors and Lisp lambda expressions in a clean manner. When it was completed, we discovered the actors and the lambda expressions were identical in implementation. They called them, if I recall correctly, I saw Guy Steele do a talk in 2006, so then abouts in Denmark. Um, they noticed that the eval code for lambdas, and they referred to the actors as alpha expressions, they noticed the eval code was the same. In other words, to evaluate a lambda, you went through exactly the same code as you would to evaluate a lambda. At that moment, there's grand unification, and everybody goes, oh my goodness, these actors, which are actually objects, are also lambdas, and they are actually the same idea, but expressed differently. Whoa. On his next walk with Kwokna, Anton attempted to impress his master by saying, master, I have diligently studied the matter and now understand that objects are truly a poor man's closures. Kuknar responded by hitting Anton with his stick, saying, when will you learn? Closures are a poor man's object. At that moment, Anton became enlightened. Now, I'm going to save you the pain of having to go through that. Um, I mean, first of all, you know, these are these are bygone eras. Uh, apparently, women did not make the same mistake about objects and lambdas and don't get a mention. And hitting your staff with a staff is really bad form. However, the point here is there is a unification here. Okay, there is an there is one idea with which manifests itself differently. Uh, an observation that uh, in two thousand and nine, um, uh, William Cook uh, made a really interesting observation. This, this paper of his on understanding data abstraction revisited is a uh, it's a kind of revisit of nineteen eighty four paper Cardelli and Regner uh, on understanding polymorphism, data abstraction, and yeah. Anyway, it's a, it's kind of classic paper on. Um, trying to get your head around a formal approach to objects and polymorphism and the different kinds of polymorphism that are available. Um, but in this uh, paper, and Bill Cook did a talk, or Bill Cook did a talk associated with this, he made this lovely observation. Lambda calculus was the first object oriented language. It's like, huh, interesting. You know, again, this unification idea. So I'm gonna so let's so let's look at this. So I'm gonna go to the most um 
the, the most overspecified data structure in the history of computer science, the stack. We're going to recreate the stack because honestly, we're 40 minutes into the talk and I haven't used um, enough C++ and I certainly haven't reinvented the wheel. Uh, off. Well, no, actually I have reinvented the wheel. We just reinvented integers and we will come back to that. So I'm going to have a stack, stack of standard string um, of words. Uh, its depth is zero. Um, when you ask for its top, uh, it's just going to give you null op because it's empty. We're not going to go for an exception approach here. Um, then we're going to push C. Then we're going to have C++ on C. And depth will now be two. And the top will be C++. And then we will pop. And um, and then the top will be C. What you will have noticed is that I've made stack, in this case, an immutable or persistent data structure. Its old state persists. Um, when I provide, when I make an operation, I don't treat it as a state machine. I do not push onto a thing and change its state. Uh, it's transformation. Um, effectively, what I'm doing is I am, I'm asking a question. I'm not issuing a command, although I've used an imperative word here for familiarity. Um, I'm, uh, I'm asking what is words um, once C has been pushed onto it, and it will result. In, it will give me the results. Just as if I add two to five, it'll give me seven. And the no fives or twos were harmed in the making of that seven. So what we've got here is this simple idea that a stack, um, it is uh, it, effectively what we're doing is we're asking for the push of. Return me what you would be if you push this one on. Okay, so when we look at this, um, how can I express this? You've probably got some ideas in your head. And this is actually what I did as a lightning talk I did a, uh, I've done a, a couple of lightning talks. A, a different version of this was at C++ on C last year um, as a list. And I did a variant of this one at the ACCU conference um, last year. Um, my years are getting muddled up. I'm sure yours are as well. Um, I was just trying to remember, what was the last ACCU conference? I don't know, 2020 is not a year. Yeah, it was 2019. So this is what it's going to look like. Stack. OK, I'm going to keep it as struct because guess what? There is no data. What do you mean there is no data? I don't have to keep anything private. This is all public. There's a stack. Great. So that gives us an empty stack. Now, I can take the new element and I can take another stack and I can compose or construct a new stack. Now there's depth. Now that might not be the signature you were expecting for depth. Depth is a function um, that takes nothing and returns a stood size t. But it is a function, it's a stood function, not a function function, member function. And the same for top, and the same for pop, and the same for push. Ooh, this is interesting. So what are these going to look like? Well, it turns out that um, for an empty stack, then an empty stack is always an empty stack. Remember, you never change these things. An empty stack is always an empty stack. Zero is always zero. One is always one, and so on. So. Whenever you ask an empty stack, it's, you can hard code the result to zero. Uh, its depth is always zero. It will always, it has no top, so null opt is what you get. Um, when you pop, well, I'm going to say that that's not an error. Uh, I'm going to say that's the identity operation. When you pop an empty stack, you get an empty stack. And then push is the fun bit. We compose a new stack. We return that. Great. Yeah, so that's what an empty stack looks like. But notice we've got a beautiful separation of concerns. This is what an empty stack looks like. This is what a non-empty stack looks like. We've basically taken a state model and organized it like this. The depth is one plus whatever the depth of the tail was. The head is whatever you just told me. Okay, I've captured closure on everything. We'll tidy things up in a moment. And pop is, well, the tail. And push is, well, let's do that thing again. And now notice that, uh, and so I can tidy things up and actually you know, um, make the... <laughs> Okay, I've got to be careful here. I've made depth more efficient. In other words, rather than actually having multiple function calls, I've, I've actually pre-calculated it. But the idea of using more efficient in this context, I, I need to reiterate, honestly, don't do this at work. This is, this is for fun and enjoyment, intellectual stimulation, and to possibly blow your minds a little bit, to get you thinking about the stuff in a different way. The stack, you'll notice it has no private state. It is just these composition of lambdas with closures. And this is actually a very old idea. This is the fundamental idea of objects. Uh, back in structured programming, a uh, book published in 1972, um, uh, Uli Johan Dahl, uh, one of the uh, co-inventors with Christian Nigard of Simula 67, the uh, first object-oriented language, uh, Edsger Dijkstra and Tony Hoare in 1972 published this book. It wasn't really a coherent book with a narrative. It was really a collection of their essays on this thought. So collected writings from 68, 69 onwards. Um, but in their section on object-oriented programming, which was at this time considered to be an idea of um, 
of structured programming because it's not not structured. Um, they, uh, 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 Darlin and Hall made this observation. One of the most powerful mechanisms for program structuring is the block and procedure concept. And this is not something that C++ quite gets. C, it's, it's not, it wasn't present in C and C++ did not do anything to change that. Uh, but it is one of the classic ideas of block structuring that you can embed procedures within uh, in a block. Uh, you know, a block can contain a procedure definition. Oh, in fact, let's show you. Okay, let's just imagine we've got a block, begin, end. Um, I've got an array of items, one up to some capacity, which is reference to rocks. That's not originally part of Algol 60. What I'm showing you is mostly Algol 60 here. Um, a very different language to Algol 68. Um, then I've got an integer count. This is back in the days when Algol, you know, you had to spell out the word integer, but, you know, Algol 68 got rid of that. Um, and we can do assignments. We can do ordinary things, but you can also embed procedures within your block. And procedures are based on blocks, which can contain, and so, you know, it is turtles all the way down. So that's the definition of stack. The great idea, the idea that Simula introduced is a procedure which is capable of giving, giving rise to block instances which survive its call will be known as a class. In other words, if you think about a block as containing state, variables, and functions, and other executable code, which will effectively be constructor-type code, you could regard that as the action or the initialization of, of that block. That normally disappears off the stack frame when you think about it. You enter the block, you, you execute stuff, you do stuff, you exit the block. But what if that block lived on? Well, that's a thing. It's a thing with behavior and state, which we call thing, object. In fact, instances will be known as class. And that is the key idea. You just shove that on front and suddenly, boom, you, that's, that's the invention of classes and all the rest of it. So just as a point, these are two of the key influences. Normally, when we talk about C++ and its, its origin story, um, um, you know, clearly, Biano was influenced by C in that context that he was in at AT&T, but uh, Bell Labs, but specifically, he had experience of Algol 68 and similar. This is where these ideas come together. Um, now, let's talk notation. Um, the Nobel uh, physicist, um, uh, Richard Feynman, said, we could, of course, use any notation we want. Do not laugh at notations. Invent them. They are powerful. If somebody tells you, oh, that's only syntactic sugar, refer them to this. Mathematics is, to a large extent, invention of better notations. Um, it allows you to get your head around certain ideas, to make them convenient and accessible. Um, notation, if you use Roman numerals, um, you will discover that doing most of the stuff that you learnt at school as elementary arithmetic is surprisingly difficult. The notation matters. Okay, it never not matters. Well, never doesn't matter. Yeah. So let's look, talk about lambda. Where did the lambda, where did this symbol come from? Church introduced it. It didn't refer back to anything previous to that. Um, it's worth understanding that what he wanted was to denote this abstraction. What he originally wanted was this. Okay, not that, this. He wanted to just, and now it becomes obvious that it's a single parameter, because that's why you could only have a single parameter. Um, and he, the problem, Church is American, and US publishers, unlike French publishers, did not have access to an awful lot of circumflexes uh, in the printing press. Um, so the suggestion came, well, why don't we move it to one side? Uh, that looks like a lambda. Yeah, that's a capital lambda. So why don't we go all the way? Um, so that's that's the origin story. Now, when you, that's, oh, okay, I say the origin story. That's my preferred origin story. Turns out that Church said this. He also later in his life said, because he liked the look of it, yeah, yeah. Max Langhoff has observed the great circumflex shortage. We're still living the consequences of it now. Um, he, uh, at another point, he said, because I liked it. Um, you know, uh, so in other words, it's lost as a whim. But I prefer this origin story. It makes more sense of it. Um, so, so um, and it is the one that more people credit to being true based on conversations with the church earlier in his life. Uh, so how do we do this in programming languages? Ah, well, we've already seen that Lisp spelt lambda lambda, and Python spells lambda lambda, um, and uh, a number of languages do that. Haskell just strips it right back, backslash. Um, JavaScript originally went with function. Um, Clojure, interesting enough, goes with fun. Um, apparently, they are suffering the great vowel shortage um, uh, still. Um, and what is funny is that actually uh, the point is made that actually anonymous functions are different to lambdas strictly. And there are actually, in that sense, no lambdas in Clojure. Um, it doesn't, there's nothing that they call a lambda, which I think is either a, a, it's a failure of irony because the logo for Clojure 
it's kind of a little bit lambda. Um, so yeah, I think that I don't, and I don't think that was an intentional humour. I think that was a, a, just a, a, a failure of uh, uh, insight. And we have you know JavaScript, uh, ECMAScript six, or C sharp Scala. They like to use the equals arrow, uh, equals greater than um, uh, Java. And in one of Ruby's, Ruby has multiple ways of expressing this. Uh, groovy like the arrow hit C plus plus, and that's how we kind of think about it. The capture is the introduction. Hey, compiler, guess what? Something's about to happen, which does give us this glorious observation of C plus plus that this is actually legal syntax. Um, you know, you can actually put all your brackets together, and it, it, it compiles. And this, it does nothing, um, but it's it's legal. Uh, I think the most exciting version of this that I've seen is uh, Shafiq Yagmo's uh, version. This does nothing. This is a gloriously elaborate way of doing nothing. Um, so, uh, uh, yeah, feel free to pepper your code with that um, to make it just look a, a little bit more obscure. Now, point I want to get back to. Yes, C++ lambdas do satisfy the three laws. If I go for the square, then we can see here is our abstraction, there is our variable, and there is the application. It works as an expression. Um, this is important because not all languages, when they introduce a thing called lambda, have lambdas. Uh, Java, for example, I made a comment earlier on, Java introduced uh, lambdas in 2014. Actually, it didn't. It introduced a construct called lambdas. Um, that gets really, really close to this, but it doesn't allow, you can't actually define a lambda and then use the lambda directly on a parameter list. Um, you have to, it, they're not properly first class citizens of the language. Um, now, for those of you who are working in C++, you already know that functions are objects in C++ because that is the way that they are implemented. But the, well, the key point here is I want to say that there's something deeper. That's not just an implementation detail. Um, there is a, a deeper unification that we've seen already. So let's go back to Hitchhikers and Ford's observation. Um, um, oh God, muttered Ford, slumped against a bulkhead and started to count to 10. He was desperately worried that one day sentient life forms would forget how to do this. Only by counting could humans demonstrate their independence of computers. Um, and I'm just looking at the chat and uh, Hendrik appears to have started a uh, language war. Excellent. Go for it. It took a while, didn't it? You know, come on, let me fan the flames. Um, so let's go back to the numbers. Let's go back to our handcrafted, lovingly handcrafted artisanal integers. Um, that, remember that was zero. And, you know, we had all of this. And then... I can do this in a language. Um, so in other words, what I really want to do is just turn this straight into code. Now, if I used a language that was Lambda friendly in terms of its syntax, then I could do that. This is, um, uh, this is JavaScript, which for all of its faults, um, where all is a surprisingly large set, um, it does have a shorthand elegant syntax um, for uh, dealing with this. And it's actually the most direct translation in a mainstream language um, uh, for expressing this. Um, so I also want to remind you that we define the successor relationship to make life easy, because that is going to expand horrifically um, when I put this into uh, C++. So let's not do that. Um, let's do this. So here's the successor relationship defined in, um, uh, uh, in JavaScript. Um, fortunately, thanks to Auto Everywhere, I can do this in C++. And let me just stretch it out rather than shove it all onto one line, um, stretch it out so we can see the nesting and the enclosures and what's actually going on. Um, and there's a kind of like nice echelon formation, sort of like sort of um, like geese migrating in uh, in the winter going south. Um, there's a kind of like that feel to this. So what does that mean zero is? That's what zero is. Cool. So let's abbreviate that. Now, brilliant. Excellent. So we've now got church numerals. That is the official term for this. Uh, you can do church numerals in C++. You could not do that before auto everywhere. You could not do it in a generic way. Um, let's put it that way. You normally had to make a certain type commitment in a couple of places uh, or just experience a lot of syntax, even more. Now, let's let's mess about. Are these really numbers? Um, do they do numberness? If I've said that three is threeness, it is the threeness, it is the application of. In other words, we are defining a number by its action effectively. Um, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to define a, I'm going to define a lambda, I'm going to define an abbreviation, I'm going to define a function basically. Um, I'm going to call it plus one. I have put n plus one uh, there in a different um, 
in a different uh, color because I want to highlight the bits that are not original lambda calculus because plus one comes to us from the world of integers and arithmetic. And I just said, if we're going pure about this, then we have no, um, so typed lambda calculus normally does have um, types and it has, it supports simple arithmetic and simple type lambda calculus, which was one of Church's, uh, he, he did a simple type lambda calculus. It supports the basic stuff. You, you want to be able to do arithmetic and basic symbolic stuff. But I'm going to put the stuff in green um, I'm actually doing that from memory. Yes, it's green on that monitor. It's not green on my main monitor. Uh, I'm slightly colorblind just to, for reference here. Um, uh, I'm going to put stuff in green that I brought in from outside. So these are these are C++ integers. The other stuff is our expression of lambdas in C++. So stuff that is white is kind of the pure lambda stuff. Uh, uh, so let's take zero. Let's pass it plus one, because if you remember, Zero is a uh, underscore zero. Um, is a uh, is is a lambda. It is uh, so. It is the applicability of. So let us apply it to something. Let us apply zero to plus one uh, with respect to. Well, I'm going to keep using um, my C plus plus integers. Let's start with zero, and that gives us zero. Well, that's not really very exciting, is it? Ah, this is getting a bit more interesting. Oh, this is interesting. So if we print this stuff out. What I've done here, let's go back to three. Plus one is, it is the threeness. It is given a zero and then applying plus one to the result of plus one to the result of plus one against zero, I get three. That So in other words, we can actually pass a function in and it will generate for us the threeness that we wanted. Now I'm just going to make a small tweak to plus one. I'm going to make it a little more general. Um, there's a little um, a facility that I wrote uh, about 20 years ago, called Lexical Cast. Um, it's or it was originally actually called um, Interpret Cast. It was published in C++ Report. Uh, it was just a throwaway remark, um, and then we put it into Boost. And uh, it's since acquired a lot more complexity, but it also acquired a different name, Lexical Cast. So what I'm going to do is I'm basically going to say, well, whatever the type of the thing is that you passed in, then I want the Lexical Cast the interpretation of this with respect to the type that I've got. In the case of integers, then I get exactly what I had before. In other words, you pass in an int and it turns out that one reinterpreted as, uh, or zero reinterpreted as an integer is zero. So we're good. Uh, one reinterpreted as zero is, is one, but it gets much more fun. Yes, that's passing strings. You do that and you add one, well, it's one string. Um, and there you go, you've just reinvented unary. Forget binary, um, we can count a unary. And uh, in other words, the threeness is now three ones. Um, uh, we've got the threeness of it. So we have bigger problems to solve. Clearly, we have to solve square. Let's define square. And this is all the lambda stuff. Square is the twoness, it is m with respect to twoness. What does that mean? One minute, m squared, m to the power two. What I'm doing is I'm going to pass in a number to two, and I'm going to say, what is the what is m applied to m? What is three applied to three? I want three of those. What's three threes? Ah, this is how it works. This is how you... So in other words, I, we just accidentally reinvented um, multiplication here. So square of seven with respect to plus one, with respect to zero, the answer you have been waiting for since the beginning of this talk. There it is. Okay, so... Let's just mop up a couple of bits and pieces. Um, and um, before we have a, a chat with uh, George Bull, uh, there is a question. Can you uh, suggest a good resource? So this one from Hendrik. Can you suggest a good resource for learning Lambda Calculus? Oh, that's a good one. Not from the church paper. Um, I think... Actually, there's quite a good one. Uh, Computer File, YouTube. Um, go look at Computer File. Um, on YouTube, there's a really, there's a couple of really good videos there. Um, I think Hutton does, uh, Derek Hutton does uh, a couple of nice videos where he looks at a couple of these things. But if you Google around, I've actually found there's quite a lot of good tutorials, four or five pages uh, long. Um, the Wikipedia entry is not really a necessarily a good learning resource, uh, but there's actually plenty of university materials that are online uh, that are worth uh, getting into. Funny enough, the one that I learned from most um, about all these numbers and things, I think I had some influence from Gerd Lesher Bach, which I read when I was much younger, but I also read um, The Emperor's New Mind by um, uh, 
Oh, good grief. The name's gone out of my head. Um, uh, Roger Penrose. And in that, he, he, he comes up with a theory of mind, which I don't think is plausible, but he, to do that, he goes through a magnificent tour of physics and maths uh, and, and science to date. And in that, he sneaks in lambda calculus. And I was really quite blown away by his introduction. I thought that was a very coherent one, but I wouldn't necessarily say buy the whole book for that. So um, I'm almost at the end, but um, I, I, I want to give you a little bit more insight onto some of the other cool stuff and bring this full circle. I'm going to show you, the first thing I'm going to do here is I'm going to show you, um, I'm going to show you the nature of truth. So there you go, truth. In these post-truth times, it is a, uh, it is challenging. Um, it is slightly challenging. This is what true looks like. This is what false looks like. Well, we've just done church encoding for numerals, church numerals. What about church booleans? Well, yeah, actually. Um, true, basically, um, uh, given two parameters, then yielding the first is true and yielding the second one is false. We, we encode it like that. Then it basically means that when we take a truth and apply it to uh, uh, ex uh, expressions, then it'll return one if it's true, it'll return the other one if it's false. And this is kind of interesting because this sounds like polymorphism. And you might say, well, surely this stuff is so abstract, Kevin. You did say that it wasn't safe for work. Yeah, kind of. I did show you that Ruby uses, does actually have an idea of uh, endness for integers. And I said it came from Smalltalk. The Smalltalk language actually uses church, uh, something based on church booleans um, for its truth, uh, for dealing with if. It doesn't have an if statement. Booleans are objects. So in this expression, seven times seven yields us an integer less than limit. That yields us a Boolean. And that Boolean is either true or it's false. And it receives a request, if true, if false, that's two parameters basically that are labeled um, and the arrow means return. So if true, let's thumbs up, if false, thumbs down. In the true class, the override, um, in the true class, the override of this, um, we will return the to do thing and uh, evaluate it. Um, if in the case of the false class, we return the false one and we evaluate that. Um, so. Um, this is kind of neat, um, but let's, let's, we're, we're on a journey of unification here. False was this one. And as we remember, alpha equivalence tells us we can put any symbol in there that we like, including this, which is the same as zero. It turns out the encoding for false and zero are identical um, in uh, lambda calculus. And for those of in the C, C universe, we knew this, okay? It, there's a proof that zero is false. But the bit I'm going to leave you with is that it's not just about numbers and booleans. I can actually encode. I can use church encoding for higher order constructs. Here's a pair. And the pair first and second, I've got a basic model of data abstraction here. These are common terms um, that are used. So just so you know, Stepanoff, Alex Stepanoff did not invent pair first, second. These were common throughout um, uh, common currency in this kind of space. Um, and I can shorthand this in other ways. But it also turns out that a pair, if I've got a pair of things and I can get the first and the second, then I can actually use this to create lists. I can construct a list from the head and the tail. The head is car in Lisp terminology. Coulda is the tail. Car is the first element. If I've got a pair, then I can have the value that I want in the first one. And then the second one has either um, can have another pair which can hold another pair as a second and so on and so on and so on. In other words, this is a linked list. And of course, we need to terminate it. And there are many different conventions for what should be nil, but we now know that false is fairly good and zero, um, which means we've just reinvented Lisp. But also, to bring this full circle, we've also just reinvented our stack. And that would be how we'd uh, uh, express that. And on that note, I would just like to... Um, kind of wrap up really, um, that I hope that this has been a, um, a useful tour in some senses of um, these ideas and uh, uh, that really this is where lambdas came from. And I'm not saying, you know, go forth and use all of this in your code. Um, clearly, no. Um, uh, but there are ideas there. It shows you the origin story. It shows you what's really going on in lambda. It perhaps gives you a different appreciation uh, and can perhaps connect a few other points in computer science uh, for you. And that's what I really want to emphasize, this idea of unification. I think 
all too often we are taught ideas that are separate that actually have a common basis. And we end up learning end things when actually there's something deeper and one that we could be learning that gives rise to all of these aspects. Um, so, um, oh, Phil, you're shocking. Thanks, Kevin. I finally get some closure on this matter. That's terrible. Well done. You really, you really, you know, uh, uh, are meeting out the punishment. Um, <laughs> Powerful's observation. So Lambda Calculus is kind of functional programming of regular people, but upside down, inside out. Yeah, you know what? That's not a bad way of looking at it. Um, but yeah, hopefully, I, hopefully that has revealed perhaps more about lambdas than you knew or ever wanted to know, uh, but has given you a, a kind of different insight as to what they were originally for um, and uh, the journey that took us here and gave a, you know, as is often the case with um, inventions, um, gave us an invention that we use for quite different reasons and turned out to be quite serviceable and, uh, and convenient. And we rely more on the abstraction, um, uh, the general abstraction idea of whatever our surrounding language is doing than we do of the deeper idea of abstracting the universe. Um, so, um, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll just stick around for a couple of minutes if there are any more. Um, yeah, I don't think Phil it can be automatically allowed to win um, uh, the pun contest. I think that would be, um, you know, I, I think as an organiser, I think he should be excluded from that. Um, so, yeah, any other kind of thoughts, questions? Because I, I guess I'm eating into lunch. I'm eating into my own lunch without the food. I'm eating in without the eating. Yeah. Um, uh, oh, thank you very much, Max. Uh, Yeah, so hopefully if I put stuff in there, not just the uh, song from Frozen, you know, I'm sorry to give you that earworm earlier, um, but if I put some stuff in there that'll kick around, then uh, then my work here is done. So thank you very much. <laughs>